In this video, we're going to be talking about in products and a little bit about informed action that students can do. The basics are this. Students need to be able to produce something at the end of, you know, basically any lesson or any unit, especially that they're working on. And the more that these things associate with something of value, something that the students actually care about, something that the students can master, like a skill, the more likely our students are going to be motivated to do the work that we would like them to do. All right, so we're back into the C3 framework and we're in Dimension 4. And as we can see from our title, Dimension 4 is communicating conclusions and taking informed action. I'm going to focus on this top paragraph here, but like the rest of the C3 framework, there's quite a bit of reading. It's really good if you would like to take the time yourself to do so. And you know, if you want to pause me too to read the entire paragraph yourself, feel free. I'm going to really focus on one part, this idea here then develop claims and use evidence to support those claims. And that's really what the taking informed action bit is about. Actually taking the knowledge that we've given students through the curriculum and then actually letting them do something, make arguments and then hopefully use some reasoning and evidence to back up those arguments. We can see here too in the second line that it's also about communicating and critiquing with one another in public venues. The public venue can be as small as the classroom, letting students have that opportunity to present to their peers, but also could be a wider public venue, like presenting to the school, presenting to another classroom, presenting to their parents. This era of online education, this Zoom space, this kind of online space we have, has really created some opportunities where students could communicate what they know to their wider community. So really, that's what taking informed action is, doing something with the knowledge that you've gained and then actually being able to communicate it. And what we're going to do is we're going to scroll down and look at some standards that will help us understand how we might actually do that in the classroom. All right, let's go ahead and start scrolling down to see what kind of standards we have. Like the other dimensions, the dimension four is broken up into different you know, components or categories, I should say. So this first one, communicating, critiquing conclusions, very much focusing on that idea of communicating and then also looking at something that somebody provides and then critiquing it. So if we remember from last time too, we have four different columns. Each one's represented by the end of a certain grade. So these first two are elementary, then we have middle school here, and then we have high school. So for secondary folks, we're really in this realm right here, but it's a really good reminder that if you have a district that wants to vertically align from elementary to high school for social studies, then this is a great document that's already given you a good head start. So we see here, we have some ideas of how we could potentially communicate and critique. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down though. We're gonna see this, these are our standards, critiquing conclusions. I want to scroll down to taking informed action because that's really what we're talking about today this idea of what does it actually mean to have students create something and do something with the knowledge that we give them you know oftentimes we say in social studies that history is very valuable if only people knew their history understood their history or understood how the government works their local civics or economics then our democracy our country would be a lot uh, better and i agree i think it would be much better however i think sometimes we forget that it's not just about memorizing facts and like having a grasp of like historical factoids. It's more about like what can you do with that historical knowledge? And that's what really is um, taking informed action. So if we look at the standards here, you know, I'll read this one out loud or at least bits of it. We can kind of see that idea coming through of like taking that knowledge and doing something with it. So here it's encouraging us to have students draw on multiple disciplinary lenses to analyze how a specific problem can man itself, man itself, <laughs> can't speak, manifests itself at local, regional, and global events over time. I'm going to pause there. So here we already are talking about a specific problem, that idea of giving students something to inquire over could be a problem that they create, you know, that they, that, that they created the problem, but a problem that they identified or something that the teacher gives them. Um, that should be drawn on real issues, either historical or modern. We also see how they want us to connect to a local connection, regional connection. So I think in South Dakota, for example, students shouldn't just be studying things that are happening at the federal government level, at the national level. We should understand our own you know, local problems in South Dakota or our own local communities. Regionally, we should understand how South Dakota connects with the rest of the Midwestern Great Plains region. And of course, there are global connections that we should be making as well. So we kind of see here what it's trying to get students to do. And then down here we have, and then challenges and opportunities faced by those trying to address the problem. So here we have students really working and wrestling with problems. They're taking that informed action. And again, hopefully the problem is coming from something really you know, real. And if it keeps scrolling down, you know, I won't read the rest of them, but you can also see how these might apply to your uh, school rooms. 
This one actually right down here is one of my favorite things to do, this idea of letting students work in the classrooms and in the school um, or even outside of school civic context and do something with that knowledge. It's more democratic. So again, these are the standards. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see there's some literary connections. But for the most part, for this workshop especially, we're going to be really right here. That's where we're going to draw our standards from. So we're going to go ahead and move on and actually see what a lesson plan might look like when we're using these standards to design some curriculum. All right, so we're back at our lesson plan naming over indigenous peoples, and it looks just like what we did when we left off. We have our state social study standards here. We have our C3 framework standards, our additional standards, those are Chetty Sakowin, essential understandings, and our language arts connection. So what we're going to do now is we're going to scroll down to the end products. We want to see exactly what we're doing with these standards by improving our curriculum. And the first place we're going to stop is those end products. So we're going to scroll past the compelling question. We're going to go past all these staging the warm-ups, the formative performance tasks. And we're going to be right here. The summative performance task and the taking informed action. Now, we're going to start at the end of the lesson plan because we're going to do something called backwards design where we're really going to think about what do we want our students to be able to do at the very end of our lesson. Backward design is a very powerful format or way of doing things, a set of procedures that we can implement. And again, it really just, it's kind of simple. It just starts with what do you want students to produce? So here we have our summative performance task. We have our inquiry-based argument. And we even right here have an example of what we would like our students to be able to do. So we're going to start with designing the summative performance tasks, specifically this inquiry-based argument. Now we're going to do this backwards design together at the workshops, but right now what I would like to do is kind of model for you, show you exactly the process and what it might look like. Now what you're seeing here is actually the final version of me playing around with the standards, making improvements on um, a summative activity that was already completed. What I would like to do is show you that process. I'm going to put the standards on one side, put the you know incomplete summative assessment that I was looking at, and show you exactly what I was thinking, how I was doing it, and then hopefully kind of give you an example of what this might look like. All right, so now we're at a new Google Doc where I only organize the things that we need. So I organized it by the standards and the actual summative assessment that I had to work with, and then I'm gonna show you how I transformed it. Now to kind of be a little more clear, what we have here are the actual labels for the standards, just like we had before in our lesson plan. Same thing again, here are the specific standards for the state, RC3, Ochetti Sakowin, and our English language arts. Now, what's different is this right here is the original summative assessment. So that's what, when I was looking at um, that original lesson plan, that's what I had to work with. And using these standards, I created this new one. I even color coded the sections that go along with each standard because I want to be very clear on exactly how I did things. So let's go ahead and start looking at our first summative assessment. And to be clear too, I actually wrote this for a publication that I created. And I really wanted to use something that I actually made because I wanted to show everyone that you know, even someone who makes stuff and publishes it, if we use standards, we can actually continue to add depth. And so I picked this one because it was just one of those lesson plans that I wrote. I wrote it quickly and I, you know, to be honest, I reference standards, but definitely and certainly not in the uh, depth that I'm going to do with you. So let's go ahead and look at this first one. It says, based on your examination of the treatment of indigenous peoples in the United States, Australia and Guatemala, develop a claim in response to the compelling question. How can the naming of people, places, and events around the world demonstrate the marginalization of indigenous cultures against the forces that try to dominate them? So, not a bad summative assessment. Something that I can easily see a teacher doing. I, I overall think that if I was doing this in a classroom, I could easily see why it would be important, especially because I want students to develop a claim. So, one of the first things I like to do is I start kind of highlighting or bolding in this case those big verbs I think are important. So we have develop a claim right here. I also look for other uh, keywords I think are important um, just to help me kind of figure out what are students going to need to be able to do later. So for example, I see here it says based on your examination. So that means that students have been working on something prior to the summative assessment. So they probably need stuff to bring into the summative assessment. That's not going to be so important for this video, but in a later video, it certainly will be. So if we keep looking, um, we see topics like we're definitely talking about indigenous peoples, which is lucky for us because that connects to our Ochetti Sakowin standards right here. 
Then we actually get into the compelling question. How can the naming of people, places, and events around the world demonstrate the marginalization? I think that word's important. That's what we're focusing on. And again, we're focusing on indigenous cultures, similar to peoples, against the forces trying to dominate them. So we got to figure out kind of what forces means, too. So that's what I normally do in the beginning. I start bolding words, especially verbs, because um, that's kind of tell me, like, what the students actually have to do. And then I just start finding things I think are important, like... How is it actually, like, what needs to build up to the lesson? What are some important terms or themes? And based off that, it kind of just helps me now look at the standards and figure out how to make these improvements. So when I did this the first time, I didn't have my little handy-dandy color-coded, you know, what standards are going with what, but I didn't want to spend, you know, an hour or two just showing you exactly me grueling through this. And it is grueling. It did take me two hours to really sit with these standards and look at how these things can connect. And I owe that to a little bit of, like, I'm performing for you, so I want to make sure it's good. But I also think it, if you're going to be sincere about these things, it does take a while. But for our purposes, at least, we have this information that's going to help us. So let's go ahead and look at this first one, organize and use. Where did I get that word and why did I change it? So we look down here, we see it comes from D2, history, 16, 6, 8. I recognize that as a C3 framework, so we have it right here. We see that says organize apical evidence into a coherent argument about the past. So we picked this standard because we really wanted to focus on how students organize their evidence. But if we look at the original um, summative assessment right here, it doesn't really ever mention that. I guess you could assume that students should know that, you know, if they're going to make an argument or develop a claim, they should organize evidence. But with students, I always think it's best to spell those things out, make it clear as crystal what we expect them to do. So I borrowed that language right straight from it. I said organize, and then I said use multiple pieces of evidence. Um, that blue one comes from a different standard, but we can kind of easily see why this is helpful. Now here, I'm going to segue real quick. I'm going to talk about it more in a video later, but we need to have clear verbs, and students need to have a clear understanding of what they're doing. Because we're going to talk about, you know, that idea of assessment. Like, students need to know what they're being assessed over. Part of what they're being assessed over is their content knowledge. Like, how well can they answer this question doing all the things that we asked them to do, you know, days prior. But if we're going to value an inquiry-based idea, if we're going to really want our students to answer questions, be thoughtful, be able to use the information that we are giving them, then we need to actually kind of, not even kind of, we need to put these skills into the actual lessons. That's why we actually really should clear up these verbs. So right here we have organize. We're going to go ahead and go on to the next one. All right, so our next one here is multiple pieces of evidence. If we use our tool, we can see it comes from D2 History 4, 6-8. So again, we can see that it comes from the C3 framework. Um, there's really no particular reason why I did the C3 framework one first. I could easily see using the state standard or Ochetti Sakowin. To me, it's more free form. I like to put these things right next to each other. And after I bold some words, I kind of just start doing the same thing. I look at the word of the verbs, like analyze, organize, describe, explain. And I try to figure out which ones are the easiest, honestly. Like, I believe in taking the, you know, the course of the river. Take the easy route at first and then kind of go add depth later when you need to and can. So we have multiple pieces of evidence. We have that right here. And I thought that was also good to clear up um, because we have here multiple factors. Now, I think multiple factors will naturally happen in a lesson plan if we give students multiple types of evidence. So that's where I, got, I included that right down there. Now, after uh, presenting about these first two, I realized I even cleared up the from your previous lessons part that I just mentioned. So I even included that with this standard right here, just to, in a way, even remind me and students that the previous lessons that we've been doing should be connecting to the summative assessment. Now, some people might ask, well, what that, does that actually mean or look like? Personally, I would really like the idea of students bringing in notes into a test. I've done things like that in the past where students had to analyze primary sources, you know, throughout a week or even sometimes weeks, and they had this set of documents with their notes, and they could take that into a test and answer some questions. I like doing things like that because, in my opinion, it gets students to think about that daily work as something that's going to be you know, valuable, something that's not just jumping through a hoop. It's actually building up to a big test that they're going to need to be able to do. Um, so here, I, I, did the, I did that color along with that. If we keep moving down, we see here that I added the word Ochetti Sakawin to honor the OSEU too. 
Now, I think it's a pretty broad way of doing it. This Ochetti Sacroin Essential Understanding number two talks about the resiliency, um, the variety of different individuals, and that's a good point. We need to remember that indigenous peoples aren't monoliths. Now, that's something that we could take across our entire lesson plan, but for this purpose of our summative, I just wrote a Chetty Sack one here, and I also wrote the word resiliency, because I wanted to show that it wasn't just about marginalization. Remember, I bolded that word up here. I really wanted to show how indigenous peoples, including the Chetty Sackowin, have certainly been marginalized, but they've also resisted. They've also have ensured that their culture has survived, and we need to talk about that as much as we talk about the marginalizations you know, of those indigenous cultures. All right, so that takes care of our first three standards. We have our two C3 standards down here and our Ochetti Sacroin Essential Understanding. And again, there is no particular reason why I did these three first. It just happened to be that way. If we keep moving down, we see that I added South Dakota after the Civil War. And I connected that down here to the yellow. So we can see, describe the changing federal policy towards Native Americans after the Civil War. Not sure why there's a one there. And, you know... If this is a history course, then we do need to make those connections. This lesson plan was originally designed to be a global education lesson plan. That's why there's connections to Australia and Guatemala and the indigenous peoples that are there. Now, I still think this is a lesson plan that could easily work in an American history classroom. However, if you wanted to change those things, like if you wanted to focus more on indigenous peoples elsewhere in the United States you're more than welcome to. I also think this lesson plan would be a really good one for a world history class where you're actually looking at the entire world and making connections to, you know, if you're in South Dakota, the local indigenous people, including the Ochetti Sacoin. Howdy, I'm back. So I did a quick uh, fix. That original English language arts standard was not the one I actually wanted to do. I wanted to focus on one that was talking about writing arguments. And I got this ELA connection from the same place I got the last one. It comes from the English language arts standards that are in the state of South Dakota, which one of my, honestly, out of all the disciplines, one of my favorite ones for standards is English because they did a really good job of actually making connections across disciplines, uh, much better than I've seen any other set of standards do that. So if you're a social studies person and you want to work with your English language arts teacher, or if you're ELA and you didn't know about it, you actually have these really great connections to different disciplines, including writing arguments. So that's why I changed it. You know, develop a can claim. I think, I think students would probably get it, but I think just saying write a coherent argument makes a lot more sense to them. Um, so I pulled that straight from these standards, and then I even referenced here uh, D2 History 16 right down there. It talks about organizing apical evidence into a coherent argument about the past. So that word coherent is also going to come up really well um, in our later videos. And, you know, looking at this now broadly, we've gone through all of them. So looking at it now in totality, I think most people would easily argue like, yeah, this one makes a lot more sense. It, it has a lot better verbiage. There are a lot more areas that make sense to grade or assess. So for example, if you were assessing this, you could tell students, hey, you need to organize evidence, and you might even have a rubric that shows them different ways of doing that. You might teach them lessons before that help them do that. However, and I would be in this camp too, honestly, especially when I was a first year teacher, you might see this as kind of being nitpicky. And like, you know, is, is this a really valuable use of my teacher time? Um, I even told you that it took me a couple hours. And I think even if I wasn't making a video, and trying to make it, you know, color coded and easy to understand, I think it would still take me anywhere to 60 to 90 minutes to do like what I did and be as thoughtful as I was. And we know as teachers, we don't always have that time. In fact, we rarely do unless it's the summertime, but we're not paid to do that. So I'm not a really a big fan of telling teachers, hey, you should spend your own personal time doing lesson planning. You should always be paid because you are a professional. Now, if you do have time, I would suggest doing this at least once or twice a year where you look at a unit plan for like a week or a lesson, whatever you're able to do, and really set a path where you can do this a couple times a year at the least during school hours. Um, if you wanted to do it more, you could probably talk to your school board, talk to your principal, see if there's some money for professional development where you could do this. But I think it's valuable because it sets us up now to plan backwards from this really solid summative assessment. 
we have all these verbs and words now that when we look back at our actual unit plan, when we're designing like the activities, the performance tasks, the supporting questions, all that stuff, we can look at this and be like, what do students need in order to be able to do this and do it well? Being able to answer that question and looking at a unit plan is going to be so valuable. And once you get the hang of it, I think you'll realize too that you, you become more efficient and quick with it. Um, but to reiterate, I don't think this is something that most teachers with the time that I know most teachers get allotted would be able to do for every single unit, for every single lesson. I think it would take years to truly go through, you know, your roughly 180 days of lesson making and do this. Unless, again, you have a school that's being supportive and you're getting that PD time. But if you can do it a couple times a year, I highly suggest it because I think you'll find that the units where you do this with are going to be the best taught units because some real good, sincere thought was put into them. And it was put into them because you use the standards that represent the countless hours that thousands of professionals you know, around the state of South Dakota, around the nation, and in special interest groups have been putting into it. All right, so that was our time together talking about end products. And as I feared, I only had time to do one where I really dug into and explained how I went through you know, going through all those standards and actually applying them to the summative assessment. Now, you might have seen things that you would have liked to change, and that's awesome. I, I would love it if you brought those things up at the workshop or even emailed me about those um, differences that you found. And at the workshop, I really do hope that you bring materials that are in product. So bring some of assessments, bring projects, bring things that you really want students to be able to do and master. And we can practice. We'll workshop together. We can sit together along with a couple uh, other South Dakota teachers who are going to help out. And we'll really look at what it means to take these things, these standards, and make our end products better which in the end will help our students have a much better experience in our classroom. All right, so that is all for me today. Next time, we're going to be talking about compelling questions and how to build those and supporting questions too. So same kind of practice. We'll be using the standards in order to build those up and just kind of make those connections that are really important. So very excited to see you next time. Please email me if you need anything. And I look forward to seeing many of you at the workshops that are coming up in April. Take care.